I started the first rent to rent model in the UK and that was in, in the middle of the recession and I I'm believe I am I have the best statistics in the UK for occupancy rate as a landlord and as an agent and very simply again I'll tell you how that came about. Uh, as the recession kicked in, I knew that I needed my tenants to pay my rent. If the tenants didn't pay my rent, I'm gone. Because ultimately everybody around me has almost gone and I know I'm on my own and I need to make sure that I get my rent every month. So I answered the phone seven days a week, 24 hours a day. Not that I didn't do that before, mm. but it may have answered the phone after five rings before. I'd answer it no, after one ring now. Yeah. I was so fast on the button because I knew that if I give the best service, yeah. the tenant won't leave me mm. or have more chance of them paying the rent. So they'd ring me up and anything they asked for, I would do my best to get it for them. And maintenance issues, clean, do you know a cleaner? I didn't say no, I don't. I go and find a cleaner. Yeah. And sometimes I, I wouldn't even take profit. I just put it together, get the cleaner and get, get them associated with what, anything they wanted. So they'd ring, I ended up getting a following of uh, Arab yeah. uh, tenants. And what they do is it's a, uh, Mr. Sean, I'm leaving next year, but my brother wants to stay. Mm. So <clears throat> they wouldn't even let the apartment go. I've, I, I have apartments that it, 10 years later have them one day empty because they won't let the apartment go. They bring their next friend, their next friend, their brother. So over time, I, I, I started getting waiting lists and requests for people that wanted to stay in my apartments. Meanwhile, Liverpool at the time had a huge amount of apartments being built. A lot of them were empty. Yeah. So, la so the reputation started coming. Sean's full. Other people's empty. Uh, other landlords weren't given the service by agents well, mm. that I was able to give, which, which no one was given service. Like I was given because my money on the line. Yeah. So without me understanding what rent to rent means, I was saying to the landlord, well, I'm not going to work for you for 10% a month. Mm. But what I can do is, I can guarantee you a rent. I'd work out that you ten percent void. Some of them had fifty percent void. But for example, to be fair, ten percent void, ten percent maintenance, five percent contingency. And I'd say, well, I'll give you seventy five percent of what the gross rent is, because they'd have agent fees. Yeah. And I'll I'll give you that. I will guarantee you that money in your in, in your in, in your bank account every month. First of all, by doing that, the landlord had peace in mind. Mm. I wasn't getting any phone calls from him. Because I was making my decision now on what I hooped, what tenants I put in their properties. I could then furnish and do whatever I wanted the property to make as good as possible without having to go back and say, can we fix this? Can we do that? So I cut out half the workload, half mm. of all the time on the phone, all the admin. And then because I give such a great service, I was, well, maybe the headline rent was 800 a month. I was asking for 900. Yeah. So I was getting my discounted property, but the landlord was getting all its money. I was then up and because of my service, I'd say, well, you can have this 800. And they'd say, but it's 900, Mr. Sean. I said, yes, but this one's 800 over there. I said, go and, go and live in the one at 800 if you want. Yeah. Or live with me for 900. Yeah. And they're like, Oh yeah, I'll stay with you. So, to, so the, my tenants started seeing the value they had by being associated with me. They know I'd answer the phone. Anyway, long story short, I have over 200 tenants now yeah. of my own. I believe I'm only the landlord in the UK that set up its own cleaning company to give free cleaning to its tenants. I have a maintenance company that gives free maintenance to the property. And our office is open seven days a week, 24 hours a day. I've listened to what the customer wants and give it to them. Yeah. Sounds simple, doesn't it? When you say it like that, that, that is what business is about, isn't it? It's finding a need 
and fulfilling that need well, in the best uh, way possible. Even, uh, there's a great statistic <clears throat> I heard that if a doctor spends eight, more than eight minutes mm. with its patient, the patient won't sue the doctor if anything goes wrong because they've built that connection. That's interesting. Yeah. I mean, you're not going to sue your kids, are you? You're not going to no. sue your mom and dad because you've got a connection. You know, yeah. say if they do something wrong when you're, you're not gonna, and you're not going to sue your best friends because you, you've got that connection. Like, at them, I, I know all these statistics now. I didn't know all the mm. statistics then. But you intuitively knew them now. Well, well, like, knew that. well you that I, 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 I did. I, I intuitively knew them and it probably goes back to when I was a kid because although the, the Irish people have very little they they stuck together and they got so much done. Yeah, like I, we we had very little money, as I said before, but there was always an abundance of food. Our front door was always open, and our it was always welcoming to anyone to walk in. And it was like that in all the houses. You used to have the, the key was always in the front door, and sometimes we'd sit down for dinner. And one farmer would come along and he'd just walk in and, hello, how are you doing? <laughs> this is Rooney, and sit down. No, oh, sit down, have dinner. No, the one, oh, do you want some tea? It was like Father Ted and Mrs. Doyle, isn't it? Tea, tea, and it would. And it would be a big table like this. And you spend hours connecting with people, making people feel good. And I remember thinking, listening to the stories as a kid about how sometimes frightening the stories were. But how connecting the stories were and how somehow if we are so poor and we don't have anything, the, I guess a lot of the skills of life and a lot of the loyalty and, and the, the hard work was instilled through yeah. those simple gestures of, of, of giving people you know, what they need. Mm, I that, that, mm. that really resonates with me as well from my um, childhood as well. Very similar experience. We weren't really poor, but the area we were in, was, everyone was living in each other's kitchens. And I don't think now I'm living in a community that that is the case because it's a, it's a better off community. It's a richer community. So I think people are more isolated in their larger houses. So it seems unfortunate in a way. Something you've lost. Yeah, something that so maybe my children will go through simply because they didn't live in a sort of poorer uh, situation. Now people talk about the Second World War bringing people together and then that culture of the NHS and uh, social security coming out of that. Mm. And as we get moved away from that kind of hardship, we're also moving away from a society that's supporting as a social support like we did after that great hardship. What do you think about that? No, it, it, it's so true. If, if anything at the moment, I'm in the middle of a farm. I, so, so I am fortunate enough to have inherited the farm um, from my grandma that passed away. But the farm is, it, it was a very active working farm when we grew up, pigs, chickens, cows, sheep, and I was always covered in muck and we were always working on the farm. And when I go back now, it's almost dead. There's a few animals there. My mom looks after a few, but it's very, very quiet. And I'm in the middle of a farm diversity, diversification project where I am employing a local farmer to work full time on my farm. I'm going to be speaking with my local school or my local parish and I want to start creating allotments mm -hmm. and I want to start getting people back before the skills are completely lost. Yeah on how to grow vegetables, on how to look after animals. And I'm building some houses at home where a bit like Richard Branson has his island. Yeah. And he brings his team there and he does projects and uh, retreats. I'm building these houses and I'm going to then have them for, for my team or possibly do the, do some short stay accommodation in the countryside, yeah. along with with uh, bringing back the community into it. Yeah. Because it's so valuable. Yeah. It's so like I <clears throat> I have my own community because 
my core team of people, we all care about each other and we, we like I, my default, if anyone ever asked me what am I doing, you must think I'm bloody sad, but my default is going to the office. I don't sit at home because it's so much better and so much fun being surrounded by my team. Yeah. Now, if the sense of community was back on the farm, my default would maybe be go back to the farm more often. Mm. Like I'm, I'm to get ready for my uh, Great Wall of China marathon. I'm very, very fortunate to have met a coach called Tony Clark, who's took me under his wing. He's the coach for Liverpool Harriers. He's he's coaches a world record holder at the moment that's going to the Tokyo Olympics. And I'm now <clears throat> in a community of runners, yeah. which I'm the worst. <laughs> I don't mind saying that. They're excited, but they're incredible people and they've took me under their wing. Yeah. And it's just an amazing feeling to be even the underdog. You don't always have to be the best as long as you're part of a community. And I like the underdog, but in this case, I'm the underdog and they're yeah. taking me. On, on the journey with them. Mm-hmm. I'm also a, a, a member of Liverpool CrossFit, which is an amazing community as well, where, again, they, they're a bunch of athletes. <clears throat> I'm in the lower end of the fitness level there, despite being training there for five years. But it's a great place to be yeah. because you're surrounded by positive, hardworking people that are supportive of, of the person that maybe isn't the best. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. One thing you mentioned then is about how you consider your team, your community. And that's one thing mm-hmm. we yeah. try and, yeah, you know, foster in our business, isn't it? Is that, you know, it's more than just about coming to work. People have lives and you need to make sure that everything, you know, people are happy at home as well as in work. And it's, mm-hmm. you can't tell people to switch off when you come, you know, in the door. Is that something you try and, you, know, you try and look after your people as not just from, hitting targets in work, but, you know, part of their whole well-being as well. There is. Now, <clears throat> I also do believe in a bit of tough love at times mm. because you, you need you need to understand personalities of people yeah. and what drives people. Some people are self-driven and if you just ask them to do a project or mention, just mention something, mm. they'll have it delivered the next yeah. day. I'm like that. Actually, I used to I used to steal people's projects and jobs because if I overheard someone was doing something, I I turn up and I would actually have done it. They'd be like, "How the hell did you do that?" Because I thought I, I know I can I can yeah. do that. So I, I I'm very um, um, not reactive. I'm very proactive with yeah. whatever. But there's other people that are reactive, and you have to show a level of support and show that you're willing to open the door. Mm and guide them through, but you can't push them through the door. You do need to know when someone doesn't fit into your your team, because if they're not the type of person that doesn't fit in your team, for whatever reason, Mm -hmm. or you're not able to help them fit in, you need to close the door because it can destroy the rest of the team. Yeah, Yeah, I think that's very important. That's part, part of when you're recruiting and when you're hiring, fit is almost more important than you know the checklist on the cv that you know they get the cvs in and it's very impressive and they come to work and they just don't gel with the team they just never really get off the ground going and it is and there needs to be a bit of humor as well yeah you you need to be able to switch from being serious to having a laugh but most importantly is you have to care about your team like loyalty integrity mm. is key if if you don't feel like you want to deliver that day you have to realize that you're going to impact the rest of your team and it's not about you yeah you know it's 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 about everyone yeah if you're a lone ranger just just find out something that you you do it on your own yeah and uh like Last week, I had a really tough week, training-wise. I really didn't want to go on Sunday morning, which was yesterday morning, mm. on a, on a, on a, on a one-hour run. I didn't even want to go training this morning, and I didn't want to go running last Tuesday. I, because of the <coughs> team, I feel that if I didn't go, I'd let them down. 
after I've done it and I've achieved my goal, then you feel great. And will the next hundred years be like the the previous hundred years? Well, it's hard to know because there's an exponential growth in information, IT, mm. AI. How many other letters can you put together? <laughs> <laughs> That's what we normally call it, isn't it? Yeah, it's our industry. Yeah. And uh, you don't, but you have to sort of base your assumptions on on the past and use it use a sort of calculated assessment for the future. And so I would say that anyone that has any sort of vision for the future has to just be a little bit patient. Look at the past, and um, this should really go. Should really be okay in a long term strategy. Okay, great. So I think we've learned quite a lot listening to you today. It's always a, a pleasure to listen to you uh, talk and hear your stories. Always very interesting. So thank, thank you, you very for, much. Thank you for coming in today. And um, if you want to hear any other stories like this, and you listen to any of our episodes, then please check out our Swift Page Productivity Podcast. Yeah, um, and if you want to subscribe to and uh, see any more of our social media, uh, go to AskSwiftCase.uk and uh, our website is SwiftCase.co.uk. Yeah, and if you want to join us in the conversation, drop a comment down below and uh, don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for listening. See you again next time.